Thank you for joining this webinar. Correspondence analysis is my go-to technique when I've got a large table of data and I want to quickly understand and communicate what it means. If you've never done correspondence analysis, you should get a lot out of this webinar. You should be able to do it on your own. If you're an expert, I hope I'll show you a few cool things. As always, I'm presenting in Displayer as it's designed for interactive presentations, but everything I show you will be able to be done in queue as well, with a couple of cool interactive examples excluded, and I'll show you doing it in queue too. Today, I will show you when and how to use correspondence analysis, how to interpret the outputs, then we're going to get into some more technical concepts of normalization, scaling, rotation, and variants of correspondence analysis. And we'll end up with a discussion of data visualization. If you love your detail, there's an ebook. But let's jump into it. All right, you're a skilled market researcher. Your life has been spent analyzing tables of data. What can you see? I'll give you five seconds. Alrighty, hopefully you understand the market. Why do we use correspondence analysis? Well, first let's get it going. If you're new to display it, if you're not sure what to do, you can just type into the search box. Even if you misspell it, and I have here, it's an A, it tells me I want to go to the visualization menu, dimension reduction, and I want to choose correspondence analysis. In this case, of a table. See the other options here? Because I've got a table. I hook it up here to my data in the car example. And what can you see? That's right, in the top left, we can quickly see that Volkswagen Golf and Opel were popular. Did you work that on the table yourself? Bottom left, Toyota Prius, Citroen, Picasso, they're green. Did you see that on the table? And we can see that Mercedes and Audi are luxury, which you probably knew already. But look how quickly we get to the inside. It's just so much faster. Now, think about this table. Let me scroll. 42 brands. Oh, my God. Columns. Dun, 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 dun. 15 columns. You can't understand that data. Maybe if I gave you a couple of hours, you'd get there. And here's the correspondence analysis visualization. It's very detailed, sure. But top left, around up here, Lee Jeans, Reebok Athletics, Nike, they're competitors in terms of brand positioning or perception, and they're outdoorsy and tough. Bottom left, Lexus, American Express, Calvin Klein, these are upper class brands in terms of their brand personality. It's detailed, but we've taken this massive table and we've compressed it into a format where we can quickly get conclusions. And that is the point of correspondence analysis. It condenses information very efficiently. It's a wonderful, wonderful tool. But now we'll move into the one thing that you really need to know, which is how to interpret it correctly. And the thing is, it's not super complicated, but it's not obvious. No one ever has guessed how to read correspondence analysis correctly. We're going to work our way through a really simple example. We've got this table. What can we see when we look at it? Well, the strongest pattern here is actually that Diet Pepsi is strongly associated with 50 plus age group. And I say it's the strongest pattern because five divided by zero is it's huge difference, five divided by two. It's just much, much stronger in terms of the relativities here. What else can we see? Diet Coke is weak among the 18 to 24s. We can see that Pepsi is strong among 25 to 49s. Coke is the most popular in all age groups. It's kind of the big pattern, really, which is almost a non-pattern. And Coke's stronger among the 18 to 24s. Okay, so that's what we know the table actually shows us. Let's, and I just want to emphasize with the strongest pattern. 
Um, most of us as commercial market researchers focus on absolute differences. But really, when we think about relativities and correlations, this diet, Pepsi and age is by far the strongest pattern. It's important you keep that in mind. So let's get our visualisation going. We're going to again do correspondence analysis of a table. We're going to hook it up to our table showing collar brand by age. And now we're going to work our way through the next few pages, figuring out how we conclude this from that. But the mistake. The rookie mistake is to look at how close things are together and to think it's meaningful. The rookie looks at this and goes, wow, Coke and 18 to 24s, that's the strongest pattern. The truth here is that the strongest pattern in this data, which we've already seen, is that diet, Pepsi and 50 or more are really strongly correlated. And the point which I have to show you is that the correct reading of this visualisation is also that diet, Pepsi and 50 or more are strongly correlated. Most people don't get to it instinctively, but it's the correct way to read it. So how do we read it? The closer the row labels of the table are together, the more similar they are in the table. And so if we look here, we can see that Coke Zero and Diet Coke are the two most similar brands in terms of the data we're looking at. The closer the column labels are, the more similar they are. And the column labels here are the red age groups. And so we can see that 50 or more is marginally more similar to 25 to 49 than it is to 18 to 24s. To interpret the relationship between the row and the column points, we have to draw lines from each of the points to the origin. Now the origin is the zero, zero point, point where the plotted X and the Y coordinates show values of zero. We draw lines to zero and we can look at the angle with which these two sets of lines make when they hit the origin. And the angle here is very, very small. That tells us these two things are Highly, not highly, are positively correlated. The smaller the angle, the stronger the correlation, all else being equal. We also have to look at the length of the lines. The further the two lines are, the stronger the correlation. And so the reason we can say that Diet Pepsi 50 or more is the strongest correlation here is simply because this Diet Pepsi is just so far from the centre of the map and 50 or more is kind of average distance. So we've got a small angle, Diet Pepsi's got a really long line, 50 or more has got a moderate line. That together tells us it's the strongest pattern on the table. If you love your math, this is the formula you use. And it follows from that, that if we compare Diet Coke and 18 to 24, that angle is not a tight angle. It's almost flat or very obtuse for those of you that remember your math jargon. That tells us there's a negative correlation. So Diet Coke people are less into 18 to 24 or the other way around, all else being equal. And the fact that the lines are moderate length, none of them are short, tells us a reasonably strong negative correlation. And remember, we saw that in the table before as well. And we can see that there is a moderate relationship between 25 to 49 and Pepsi, so the angle is still small or acute, and both these points are reasonable distance from the middle, telling us there is a moderate relationship. And lastly, 18 to 24s and Coke, the angle is very small when we draw the lines to the centre, so there is a positive correlation, but none of the lines are super long, so it's only moderate, putting it all together. Up at the top here, I've got the conclusions we drew from the map. Underneath, I've got the original conclusions I typed in. There is one point that's really crucial to make, which is that the conclusion that Coke is the strongest in all the groups cannot be seen on the map. The map only shows relativities. We can communicate that Coke is strongest by using bubbles, and I'll return to that a bit later. But in general, we've just got to remember it's about relativities. And we can see that all of the other conclusions we got from the table, we also got from this map. If you've been following carefully, you'll have realised there's a corollary to all of this. And it is that the distance from the middle of the map is meaningful. 
the further anything is from the middle of the map, the more strongly it is related to some other data in the table. And so Diet Pepsi is our strongest relationship. It's furthest from the middle. The closer we've got, the less information is in the map. Because Coke is the most strong brand, it's actually pretty close to the center of the map. Because if you're strong with everybody, you're not differentiated. And so you cannot be a long way from the middle of the map. This next point is profound. It's a little bit hard on the brain though. I'll start with an analogy. Correspondence analysis maps present a particular view of the data. This is just like a drawing of a face. Depending on the point of view, conclusions change. So the distance between the eye and the nose changes in each of these visualizations. And in the more extreme case, look at the mugshot. How long is this person's hair? We can't really tell at all. The bottom left, when we've got the profile view, we can see they've got this little chunky rat's tail or small ponytail, whatever you want to call it. One of the ways we can address this whole issue of point of view is to rearrange things. When we have a three-dimensional globe, we can rotate that globe um, to see different things. But when we present it in a two-dimensional form, as shown on the left, information is lost. Where's Australia? And for those of you who can't tell, this is an Australian accent talking, so the map on the left is particularly bad, doesn't show Australia. And so we unfold these maps traditionally, create two-dimensional maps of a three-dimensional world. And when we look at this, we can see the wonderful country of Australia and we can start to draw conclusions. You can see here that Los Angeles is closer to Sydney, which is where I'm broadcasting from, than it is than London is from Sydney. But here's a different world map. On this world map, it shows us that London is closer to Sydney than LA. Now, you understand the geography of the world, hopefully, and that it is round, hopefully. And so you understand why this is. It's a bit, you know, you have to, when you're drawing a map, make some decisions about where things are going to go. What's the point? When we show the three-dimensional globe in two dimensions, we are going to lose information. No matter how artful we are about creating that two-dimensional map, it's going to misrepresent some of the information. Earlier, with our table of 42 brands by 15 attributes, that's 15 dimensions of data, correspondence analysis forced it down to two. So inevitably, we lose information, and we're probably going to lose a lot more information than we lost in that map of the world. And remember, the map of the world, when showing Australia and its travel distance, was manifestly very wrong. And so we're often going to have errors when we simplify the correspondence analysis. And this is communicated by some information on the edges of the table. So when we've got the current edges of the plot, I should say. So these are the variance explained figures. An older software that showed this is something called an eigenvalue. Now, the way we read it is it's telling us that if we only look at the horizontal differences between brands or between attributes, we'll explain 34.4% of the variation in the patterns or relativities shown in the original table. If we look at the vertical dimension, we will show 22% or explain 22% of the data. And if we put them together, we're explaining about 57% of the data or flipping it around, compressing all of that data that from that huge table into a little two-dimensional map loses 43% of the information. And some people get a bit upset by this. Well, I want 100% of the information, they say. No, you don't. The whole point of summarising is to get rid of information. That's the goal. Whether it's an executive summary of a report or a correspondence analysis or anything else, we are wanting to reduce the amount of information shown. Obviously, all else being equal, we'd like to have the best compression of the data, and that's what correspondence analysis gives us. But the conclusion, and the really important conclusion is, you must always check key conclusions in the input table. A mistake that a lot of people make is they look at this, they find a pattern, and they assume that is the true pattern, but really they've found a result like I showed you before with London being closer to Sydney than LA, which is just a result of how that map was constructed. So you look at the summary, you get your conclusions, and then you want to check your conclusions using the data table. Often people say to me, can I 
have significance tests on my correspondence analysis map. I'd like to show confidence bands or ellipses around these things. I've found these blog posts showing me or an article showing it can be done using bootstrapping. It can be done, but it's just always wrong because all of those approaches to analysis assume that there's no information loss, and there is. So always check key things on the table. If you use the default correspondence analysis maps, which I've, is what I've done so far, you get the best overall summary of the data. But there are some tweaks you can do to make it even better. And two of them relate to normalization and scaling. All correspondence analyses make technical assumptions about how data is normalized and scaled. In our products, Q and Displayer, this is by default set to something called principal normalization. What this means is that the map is designed to be as accurate as possible at showing the distances between the rows, that is the brands in the examples I've given, to be as accurate as possible at representing distances between columns, that is the attributes. But the cost is it's a little less accurate in terms of showing relationships between rows and columns. So that's what happens when you get the default map. If we have a table where the rows show brands and the columns attributes, it's usually the case that we're much more interested in the brands. And consequently, we're better off using a technique or a normalization, I should say, called row principle. This tries to represent the relationship between the rows as accurately as possible, but it's more accurate in terms of showing the relationship between the rows and the columns than is the default principle normalization. And the trade-off is it misrepresents to a greater extent the relationship between the column labels. And it can be extraordinarily hard to read if you do this row principle. I'll show you, you don't have to take my word for it. Here is the map we had before. As promised, it's set to default principle normalization. I change it to row principle. And I get a catastrophic mess. So the theoretically pure, practically impractical alternative is what's shown. And this leads to the third approach, which is we actually want to use something called row principle scaled. Again, the distance between the rows is most accurate. The relationship between the columns and the rows is as accurate as possible, but it's just redrawn so that everything looks neat. And then we have our map. Now, this map optimally shows the positioning of the brands and how these brands relate to attributes. Some very clever engineers spent a lot of time writing the software so that the labels never overlap. But when you've got so much information, it's impossible to write a great algorithm for that. And so usually your human brain, which is actually better than any algorithm, you can just move things around to finish up that tidying up process if you wish. As I mentioned before in the example of the face, the distance between the eye and the nose is a function of the view we take. You can rotate ahead to get a different view. In much the same way, you can rotate a correspondence analysis to make it most accurately represent a particular aspect of the data. So for example, keeping the analogy going, you would tell it to focus on the hair. So let's test what we're learning or what you already know. What does this map reveal about Mini Cooper? And it's just here to save you a fraction of time. Before today, some of you may have said Mini Cooper is similar to BMW and the Nissan Qashqai with a positioning of city. But hopefully now you'll be a bit more cautious and you'll go, well, yet yeah, probably similar to those guys, but they're close to the middle of the map. And when things are close to the middle of the map, the map is telling us little about them. Now, when you put this together with the idea that the map is a summary of information, it implies that maybe something is in the middle of the map because it's not accurately described by the map. And fortunately, there's a way we can check that. What we do is we tell her we want to redraw the map to focus on Mini Cooper. And so I go over here and focus and I type, Mini Cooper, and we're going to get a new map. What does the map tell you now? 
Yeah, we're well, still seeing Mini Copas all about city, but it's actually pretty uniquely positioned relative to everybody else, isn't it? It's the unique city car. Fiat 500, closest competitor now. Nissan, Nissan BMW completely gone to a completely different situation at the map. The conclusions have changed massively. Some people go, well, should we use correspondence analysis then? Yeah, you should use it. You've just got to remember that it's a summary and you've got to make sure that it's bringing out the key features in the data that you're interested in, which in this case is the Mini Cooper. If we just use the default algorithm, it shows us the best summary of all of the data, but if our client's Mini Cooper, that's not the most relevant one. Now, this is a good time to quickly show you how we do all the same things in Q, because as you'll see, it is identical. Here's Q. Here's the table we looked at at the very beginning. If I want to do my correspondence analysis, I go down to Create, Dimension Reduction, Correspondence Analysis of a Table. So all the options have got the same names. Hook it up. So this is exactly the same way to the car data. All of the options here, I can focus, my normalization, everything exactly the same. So I won't show you any more of Q because everything I'm explaining for display also works the same way in Q. So far, I've been showing you a technique called correspondence analysis. There are some more exotic variants. They're sometimes useful, but 99% of the time, the standard technique is the best. So if you're feeling a bit overwhelmed already, just ignore this section and tune back in when you get to data visualization. It'll take about five minutes. Sometimes you have a table that is what's called in the jargon square. Maybe all tables are square in a way, but anyway, that is, it has the same labels in the rows as in the columns and the same number of rows and columns. This is the classic example of a square table in commercial market research. It shows brand switching. 401 people purchased cornflakes on one occasion and then purchased it on the following purchase occasion. 194 people purchased cornflakes on the first occasion and then purchased Weetabix on the following occasion. We use such data to understand competitive structure in a market. If we use the traditional correspondence analysis that I've shown you so far, you would create a visualization like this. Reassuringly, at first you think, well, the brands are close to themselves because each row and column is represented and so we get shredded weeds twice and it's reassuring there's similar spots on the map. But if you think about it a bit longer, you're like, why is it in different spots? And there's a boring mathematical reason, which is quite uninteresting, but guaranteed to confuse and it looks messy. So what we instead want to do is we want to do correspondence analysis of a square table. So we hook it up just as before, and we hook it up to our data, in this case, looking at the serial data. And ta-da, just one label, all the ambiguity gone. Simpler story. A lot of people hear of multiple correspondence analysis and think it must be multiple times more useful than correspondence analysis. And some of them even don't learn correspondence analysis because they feel they're advanced and they're skipping to multiple correspondence analysis. And this intuition comes because often in statistics that's sensible. Multiple regression does more than simple regression. However, it's back to front in this case. Multiple correspondence analysis is a much less useful technique than correspondence analysis. It's virtually never very useful. The only time that you use it is an alternative to factor analysis. You should never really use it for an analyzing tabular data. Why is that? Well, never is a strong word, but very, very rare. Let's do an example. Again, in the visualization, we go to the dimension reduction submenu. We're going to choose multiple correspondence analysis. Now, to date, we have been using tables as the inputs. Multiple correspondence analysis uses the variables. So I'm going to choose some data on age and gender, and I'm also going to choose preferred color. We drag it on, and ta-da, we get our multiple correspondence analysis. Now, if you look here, it shows us for the age data stuff we've seen before. Diet Pepsi and 50 or more for age, that is still a very strong correlation, as we knew from before. Pepsi and age, yep, that makes sense. We've also got the gender information, showing us that Coke is skewing more to gender, the diet more to female, so that seems to make a whole lot of sense as well. And so you're thinking, why is Tim being so critical of this multiple correspondence analysis? It seems to be doing a good job. Well, let me show you how to do the same thing, but 
better using traditional correspondence analysis. We just create your standard cross tab, but I've got both gender and age across the top this time. Then I'm going to hook it up to the correspondence analysis. Correspondence analysis of the table. And I'll hook it up to my brand preference by age and gender. So I've created a table with the three variables that are used in the multiple correspondence analysis. It creates the map. Notice that Diet Pepsi is now at the top right and it'd be in the bottom left. That's entirely meaningless. Some people get a bit hung up on that stuff, but you shouldn't. You should only ever focus on relativities. You should never worry about something that's in the bottom right, top left, or ever really attempt to name these dimensions. There's no real need to do so. And you shouldn't do so. It tends to confuse people. So the if we look at this though, I'm telling you it's a better map. It's partly a better map because it's neater, <laughs> but Let's count up the variance explained. It's explaining 71 plus 21, which is 93% of the variation of the data. So it's doing a great job as a summary. When we look at the multiple correspondence analysis, it is only explaining 43 plus 21. So it's explaining 22, I should say, 65% of the variance. So it's a vastly worse map. It's compressing information much more poorly. And this is always the case. Multiple correspondence analysis always does a worse job at showing the information. Why is that? Well, you see, in the background, multiple correspondence analysis is just traditional correspondence analysis. But the way it works is it puts together this massive cross tab. And this is actually only a quarter of the massive cross tab it puts together. Uh, but it puts together this massive cross tab, everything by everything, and then it transposes it a couple of times to keep it exciting in the background math. And then it represents all the information. Now, the problem for us is that we're interested in age and gender by preferred cola. But the underlying table that's used to do the multiple correspondence analysis, it's also interested in looking at the relationship between gender and gender, between age and age, and between age and gender. And it's trying to represent all of that information onto that table. And the problem is we are not interested in that information, but the algorithm doesn't know that. And so it makes the decision to show less accurately the relationship between preferred color and age and gender so that it can accommodate this other information. And so when we've chosen multiple correspondence analysis, we've in effect asked it to do lots of stuff we're not interested in. And so it does a bad summary because garbage in, garbage out, if you like. Now, I showed you how we can do a big cross tab as an input to the multiple, sorry, to the correspondence analysis. If we've got two tables from entirely different data, we can combine them as well. So in Displayer, I'll select both of them and I'll just click Combine. In Q, if you go in the search function and you find, you'll search for combined tables and you'll find out how you can combine them. So now I've grouped them together as a single table. I've got some rows with incomplete data. So I'm gonna change this to say, only keep the matching rows in the table. All right, and now I've got a table that I can apply and I'll drag it to the bottom so we don't overlap everything. And we'll hook it up to the combined data. Ooh. Mouse gone crazy there, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, and so what can we see? Well, we can see the positioning that Coke and Pepsi are traditional and older. And we can see that Coke skews to 18 to 24s as do all of the age groups. And this is now, we're looking at that result we saw in that earlier table. Remember I said when we were just looking at the relationship between preferred cola and Coke, there was no, uh, and brand, it was just showing relativities. Well, the way we've constructed this data, it's now showing us this other factor, which is that Coke really is a preeminent brand in all of the different groups. And this highlights an important point. You need to spend a bit of time thinking to interpret correspondence analysis when you've got multiple um, tables underlying it. You also need to make sure that the data is on a similar scale. Now here, I've got everything on percentages between zero and 100%, which is fine. You can, just as easily combine together, say, a table of averages and a table of percentages. But if doing so, you'd want to multiply those averages by some constant so that their variation was comparable to that of the percentages in order to get a useful map. Sometimes we've got 
multiple tables which we know have got the same structure. So here, I did a survey in 2012 where I asked people how they felt about these tech brands. I repeated it in 2017 and I want to look at change over time. Now I could just combine them together as I just showed you, but there's an inbuilt way of doing it which I'm going to use. So we go dimension reduction, correspondence analysis, a table yet again, but I'll search for the tech brands. I'll choose the two of them. And it will automatically glue them together because they line up and I put little labels showing, you know, so I can see here, oops, let's get that tooltip gone. So I can quickly see here which brand is, so I've got Yahoo here and Yahoo here in the two different years. It's usually a good idea though to click this cool trend lines button, which just shows us the most recent data point and the lines moving. Now, some of you are thinking, oh, cool, can I test for statistical significance? And I know you're thinking that because I get this question a lot. Um, no, you can't. What you want to do is check for statistical significance in the underlying table of data, just like you ordinary would, standard statistical tests, and then augment this visualization by putting annotations on it or whatever little text boxes explaining the stat testing result. And so we move on to visualization. A couple of lovely gentlemen I used to work with loved 3D correspondence analysis plots. Now the logic here is that we compress information into two dimensions from higher dimensions so we lose information. If we instead show three dimensions rather than two we will show more information and here for example I've got some data looking at perceptions of different brands and you can see dimension one explains 77 percent of the variance, dimension two 17 percent and dimension three which is shown as the vertical distances here shows 3.4 percent. So I can show three dimensions and well you can play around. I, I personally think these are a complete waste of time but not everyone agrees with me. Here's the code you can run it in both of our products Q and Displayer. You just need to change the name of the table at the top and, and these are good if you've got if you've got a really bad deck of results for the client maybe you can distract him with this. I like to put brand icons or logos of some kind whenever I do one of these it's just more engaging and you can really go a bit further in display and well and make like interactive filterable reports with pretty backgrounds. Here I've gone a bit further again and we'll put little bubbles showing the importance of each of these attributes based on a driver analysis. At next week's webinar which is going to be looking at usage and attitude studies or also what's known as awareness attitude and usage studies and other bits of the world, um, my colleague Andrew will take you through other ways of making such market maps useful. A common concern that people have with correspondence analysis is the need to do this technical interpretation looking at the angles and there's a concern that maybe it's not worth the effort because you can't explain it to clients. I've got two answers for that. The first one is you need to separate out the process from gaining insight to how you share it. Correspondence analysis is undoubtedly a magnificent technique for extracting insight. If it's appropriate to share with your client it depends a lot on the client. If your clients for example are regular consumers of research and working in marketing teams they're going to be very used to using correspondence analysis and many of them will already know about the angle and correct interpretation and you can train them up if they're not used to it. If you've got a truly non-technical audience you should use the correspondence analysis to find the insight and then find a better way of communicating it. But there is another way of displaying correspondence analysis called the moon plot which isn't as pretty but is actually pretty much impossible to misinterpret. You don't have to explain about the angles. The way we read it is the closer brands are the more similar they are. So we can see Coke and Pepsi are very similar. We can see we've got this very tight cluster of these three energy brands, which are these little cans with high amounts of caffeine in them. Fanta is relatively unique. The closer the brands are to attributes, the stronger the relationship. So we can see here very clearly that Fanta is very strongly associated with fun and kids. And the size of the fonts on the perimeter are telling us how strong the attribute is as a differentiator. So we can see, for example, that there's a positive correlation between these energy brands down here and the energy attribute and picks you up and a negative correlation which cheers you up but as it's such a small font it's a very weak negative correlation whereas kids and fun is very strong. 
We've got an ebook if you want more information. Later this week, we'll send you a recording of this session. We'll send you a link to the ebook. We'll send you a link to the pages that we've presented, which you can export to PowerPoint if you want to. What questions have you got? Please type your questions into the GoToWebinar field and I will answer them as they come. The first question we've got is, can you automatically show the lines on the correspondence analysis maps from Michael? And the lines, I know what you're asking because I have this question a little bit. The question is, if we take a map like this one here, The argument is it would simplify things if we automatically drew on the map the lines for people. And the short answer is yes, we could, but we're not going to because when we try it, it becomes too messy for everything. It just makes the thing unreadable. But if you want lines, as I've just shown you, you can draw them on yourself. Lauren, hi Lauren, she says, you mentioned a few times all other things being equal. Can you explain more what you mean? Um, yeah, when I say all other things being equal, I'm saying that there are usually other factors which interpret that, which affect that conclusion as well. Um, I actually can't even remember the specific case you're referring to. Um, so give me more context on it. But yeah, it's just a general, just a general way of communicating that the point is valid, assuming there's not some other information which has been ignored. Catherine says, is ranking data useful in correspondence analysis versus other types? Yeah, it's a very good question. The way it works with data is you can plot any data of any kind in correspondence analysis. You can show numeric data, ranking data, anything you like. The secret is you just have to create a table where the table has patterns in it where the tables are informative and useful and all of your numbers need to be positive. So you can definitely show ranking data. I would generally, if I'm showing ranking data though, I would generally transform it to just say top two ranks or something like that or to show average ranks rather than all of the initial ranks by category. Thank you for clarifying, Laura understands. Um, Got a question here about why can't I interpret the dimensions? So let's go and look at an example again. So in some techniques like factor analysis here, and sorry, thank you Ravi for the question, um, you name the dimensions. So you do your factor or principal component analysis and you name each of these components. But when we do that, it's because we've rotated the factors which is a bit different to rotation we talked about earlier, you've rotated the factors so that they are strongly related with a small number of variables. And that ensures that the factors are interpretable. We haven't done any such thing here. And so while sometimes there are dimensions, they very rarely line up with the horizontal and vertical axes. As an example, here there's kind of a, clearly an axis of kind of environmentally friendly up to kind of fuel guzzling a little bit. And so we could draw a line onto it if we wanted to create a new dimension, you know, and label the points, you know, sporty. The other one down here, we could label family or something like that. And Lauren asks, is there a difference between correspondence analysis mapping Q and display versus doing an XY plot? There are. So the few things that we do in the correspondence analysis, we firstly put the percentages on the axis and secondly, we force in this little zero dashed line to make it really easy to see the origin, which is really important when you're trying to work out the distances. But what you can always do, and I'll show you, we create a new page. And we'll sort of visualization and we'll put a scatter plot in. And I'm going to hook it up to the actual correspondence analysis map I did before. Whoops. Hope you can do this. Haven't tried this for a long time. And fortunately, that worked. And so this gives me my traditional displayer and queue. It's the same approach in queue. It's giving me my traditional 
scatter plot, which has got all of my normal formatting options if I wanted to do it that way. And so look, it does look different. You know, there's it's actually taking the axis labels, but I can now overwrite these and it doesn't have that really strongly emphasized zero zero coordinate. Next question is, can I do the interactive correspondence analyses like in Q from this is from Brian. Thank you, Brian. You can't. Okay, this is just doing things interactive is a display, I think. Um, Q is about doing all, you can do all of the analysis, but the actual ability to create live filters like this. Now you can filter your things in, in Q, but you can't put little pretty pictures and things in the background. That's all the questions we've got. Thank you all for attending the webinar, for asking questions. Oh, I've got another question. Hello, Anna. What kind of table should it be? Row, percentage, or column question? That's a good question. I really wish I'd mentioned that in the webinar. All right, let's go back and have a little look. The correct percentage to use is the percentage that you want to describe in the data. And so there used to be a view when I will confess until an old colleague of mine, Andrew Pavolny, corrected me on this one many, many years ago. Um, it used to be, I, I used to think you should just always use the total percentages on tables because that's what it said in a few textbooks, but it's just not correct. What you should do is you should find the table that best shows the data you want to visualise and then you do the correspondence analysis of that table. And so in market research or commercial market research, we're almost always using column percentages. And so for the reasons that you want to use a column percentage, you should use that table but again, refer back to the table to make sure the interpretations are correct. Great question, Anna. Thank you. I'm going to try and remember to do that next time I do the webinar. And that's all the questions. So as always, thank you very much for being our clients. If you're our clients, if you're not, hopefully we've shown you something magical that you need to own. Bye now. <laughs>